thank you for coming, um, and thank you for coming when it's lunchtime, more importantly. Um, so if you feel like you need to eat your sandwiches, please do. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about cl a client-centered approach to bathing. I get really passionate about bathing. I get passionate about OT, but I also get passionate about bathing because I think we sometimes don't um, consider it as part of our plan. But I want to talk to you about are we being client-centered. So these are the, the aims of the training. Uh, the understand on the importance of bathing as a meaningful occupation. Uh, to be able to clearly assess occupational bathing needs for your clients. Review what it really means to be client-centered. Clearly define the benefits of bathing. To be able to clearly assess, there's an awful lot to fit in, so I am going to be moving forward. And the key one I really do want to just concentrate on, and I might jump to it, is understanding the legislation. And I want to say to you, legislation is your friend, so really get to know it. So, my challenge to you today is the Royal College state that OTs take a whole person approach to health and well-being to enable individuals to achieve their full potential. Anybody disagree? No, that's what we do, isn't it? That is what we do. Uh, and OT value the importance of occupation. Agree? Yeah. Yeah. You'd be amazed. I went to the American Association this year, and what was really interesting is that they're just getting passionate about occupation. And I'm like, I've been doing that for 30 years. Um, so it's kind of bizarre talking to American OTs about occupation. And if we don't fully focus on occupation of bathing when we're looking at our clients, or we dismiss bathing because we don't do bathing, or a shower will fit, are we truly being client-centered? We're not. We're really not. So, what is occupation? I'm not going to ask you, because I think it's unfair to point at somebody. If I'm teaching to students, I usually point at somebody. But occupation, and I love the World Federation definition, and I use this all the time when I'm teaching, the everyday activities that people do as individuals, in families, and with communities, to occupy time and bring meaning and purpose to life. Occupation includes people, uh, things people need to do, want to do, and are expected to do. And the reason I love that is because it just doesn't talk about the individual. It talks about the families. And families, when we're doing, going in and doing adaptations, are just as important as the client. If we dismiss the family, we're dismissing a big part of that client's life. And we have to include the family as well. So is bathing an occupation? It is, isn't it? Most of us want to be clean, but the definition of bathing is washing or immersion of something, especially the body, in the water for cleansing. Yeah? Oh, nice. But is it just this? Is bathing purely about personal care? See people shaking their heads? It's not, is it? So what does bathing mean to, to you or to me? I'll say to you, bathing last night, hotel, massive tank of hot water. I didn't have to pay for it. Up to the top. What I was doing in that bath was lying back, reading The Guardian, having a great time. Did I wash myself? No. I didn't. I just lay there and wallowed. But for me, that occupation was really important because at that point, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm speaking to my RBOT show and I'm speaking to my colleagues and I needed that relaxation. And that was really important to me. So it's about leisure, isn't it? But I would say to you, it's about a whole load of other things as well. Bathing is just not about immersion in water. 
It's about play. Who, ha who, who, who has children? Yeah. Who has bathed their children? When your children were four or five, did you shower your children rather than bath them? You don't, do you? Unless they've come in from football and they're muddy and you want to get the cake mud off to start with. But fundamentally, bathing for children is a really interesting occupation because it's around development, isn't it? It's around play. It's around sharing. And all those things that come into bath, it's around messy play. How many of you have used shaving foam on tiles to move things around for your kids? Bit of uh, food colour dye as well. Great sensory activity. All these things can be done in a bath. Very difficult to do those activities in a shower. And how many of you bathe with your siblings? I have four brothers. Can you imagine? But we bathe together. You know, and we literally were in a line, all five of us, bathing together. Because it saved the hot water. And being the youngest, I was always in the last. So I always went into the mucky water. But we played and we had a great time together. But it's about leisure. It's about rest, isn't it? It's about recuperation. It is about personal care. And it is about joint pain. And people say to me, oh, well, joint pain, that's not about facilitating access to a bath. That's about a medical need. And you could say it was a medical need. But actually, if you reduce your pain in your joints, you're far more likely to be able to do another activity, aren't you? So surely that is enabling you to do additional occupations and we need to take that into account. But I use it hugely for sleep hygiene as well. Do people use it for sleep hygiene? This kind of routine focused approach, especially with children with challenging behaviour or adults with challenging behaviour, where you want to get a nighttime routine in place and actually you have a bath, you kind of hold people in lovely, warm, tumble-dry towels, you gently take them to their bed, and you get better sleep because of it. Can you do that with a shower? A shower is stimulating. It's something you have in the morning, isn't it, when you get up and you want to wake up. So we have to think what is right for our clients, and it has to be about the clients. So are we dismissing bathing? I would say at times I dismiss bathing and I probably, if I'm completely honest with you, dismiss bathing because there was this attitude that bathing is expensive and actually, or we don't do bathing, I get that from grants officers quite a lot, we don't do bathing, I said yes we do do bathing, um, and I think we dismiss it without going through our clinical judgement and this is where it needs to be client centred. So we understand that bathing could be an occupation and we understand that we need to have an individual approach and the occupation focus has to be on that in, within that assessment. But we also have to allow for maximum independence, don't we? And sometimes in bathing we can get better independence than we can get in a shower. So if you're in a shower seat, rigid as a child or an adult, and you want to teach somebody to wash themselves, it's really difficult. Have you ever sat in, I won't mention it um, at the name, a shower chair that reclines slightly and you're kind of got a belt on and you've got laterals and you've got everything else around you? Have you ever actually tried to use a flannel and wash yourself? You can't. So, so what are we doing? Are we actually disabling people sometimes by putting in a shower? And I'm not saying that a bath is a panacea, because I think sometimes it's a, a flawed product in lots of ways. And if you go to Europe, they think we're dirty in a shower, in a bath. But it's very much a British way of um, living, and we need to take it into account. But we also need to say to our families or our grown-up adults, what 
what do you want to do? What are your goals for your personal hygiene? It's not just about washing, but do you want to be able to play? Do you want to be able to relax? Do you want it to be part of a routine? And I don't think we're doing that. So are we practicing from a client-centered approach? I would question we're not. So, I often use the POE model. Do people use POE? I'm really old. And when I trained, we didn't have theories of practice. Um, I struggle with theories of practice, I'll be honest with you. Um, but I love the PEO model because it makes sense to me as a therapist. Um, so you all know the P PEO model, don't you? Anybody don't? Doesn't matter if you don't. This is about learning, isn't it? But it's basically a transactional model that describes the complex relationships between the person, the environment and the occupation. So as a therapist, we need to look at the person, what their goals are, and please, when we're assessing, let's start with goals. Let's not start with impairment. Let's start with goals. And I'll give you an example. Um, a client of mine who I worked with about five years ago, catastrophic brain, uh, um, road traffic accident, spinal injury in Stoke Mandeville, and her comment to me was, I said, what's your goals? And she goes, I want to ski again with my daughter. And you go, Okay, Stoke Mandeville, skiing, typical OT. Okay, let's break this down. How can we get there? And we did, and we broke it down. And then her case settled. And what often happens is we get sacked at that point because they're fed up of therapists being involved. But two years after that, she texts me a little photograph of her in Verbier skiing with her daughter. And you know what? That meant more to me than anything because that was her goal and she achieved it. And we were a tiny part of that process. So we have to look at what our client's goals are. And then looking at the environment and the occupation. And if we get it all right, we get this kind of maximizing our occupational performance. So person, remember you need to not only look at goals, but also measure. So, assumption of the model is occupation performance changes over a life span, life span. A person is dynamic, would you agree? How many times do people go, well, they're five, so we're only going to design for a child? Does anyone in this room know of a child that doesn't grow? Or change? Or their, their abilities change? It's a crass comment, isn't it? People grow, people change. You know, I've gone out and I've gone in again. And I'll probably go out again at some point. We all change because we're dynamic and how our environment affects us. And the interaction with our environment changes as well as we change and age. So the clinical reason behind uh, bathing is what is it about the person, the environment, the occupation that combines to allow the person to complete the occupational performance task associated with bathing. So you need to look at them all individually. So looking at the person, it is about diagnosis, isn't it? That's part of our skill, understanding a medical condition and its likely prognosis. Um, it's also looking at their behaviour, because behaviour affects a um, person's ability to perform a task. It's about cognitive abilities, isn't it? as well. It's about vision, it's about mobility, it's about capacity, it's about communication, it's about skin integrity and anthropometrics, which is the physical um, layout of a person. So it's about all those things, plus lots, lots more. Because in vision you can have sensory around hearing uh, and all the other senses as well. So we need to look at all of that. Um, can, can we change how this person reacts and, and does an activity? Because I'm sometimes we, I think sometimes I go, we need to, people go straight from a person to an adaptation, and actually we need to just step back a little bit and go, can we modify the way they do something? That's what we should be doing first. Can we modify how they get in and out of a standard bath? Is that a possibility? Can we use other equipment? 
don't listen, Abacus. But, you know, can we use other equipment? Uh, and then look at what we can, do, we can do to change other factors. And are they likely to change over a lifetime? You know, have we got a life-limiting condition or a deteriorating condition? The environment um, can have a hugely disabling effect on what you can do. And people go, and, and do you realise we have the smallest bathrooms in the UK, in, in Europe? Tiny, tiny bathrooms. The average UK bathroom is 2.2 by 1.8. It's tiny. But we can change the physical environment, can't we? There are times when you just go into a house and you go, it's not, when it's just, we can't go anywhere with this property. Usually terraced houses where you've got no space. But we need to look at the environment and the social environment. And the reason I talk about social environment is we go in, don't we, and we go, okay, so um, put in a shower and that will work. But are there other siblings? Are we looking at our, the other siblings and the effect it might have on them? And I often don't think we do. And we shouldn't really be disabling other people. We should really be looking at the whole family as a whole. And there's also cultural uh, environments that we need to take into account. I want you to note, though, that the environment is often easier to change in the person. So it's, you know, that is one to hold on to. And there is often very few properties that can't be adapted. There are some, but there's very few. You just need to have a little bit of insight and forethought. And the task, we need to look at how people actually approach the task. And it's back to this wonderful thing about um, activity analysis. Do you actually see your client doing the task? You really do need to see them doing the task. Even if it's what I call a wet dry run, so they're dressed, but you're, you're actually seeing what they do. Because people bathe in very different ways, just as people go to the toilet in very different ways. We will all do it slightly differently. And some of the ways that people get in and out of the bath amaze me. I don't know how they haven't killed themselves. But we all do it in a different way because we've learned from our parents or our grandparents or our siblings. And we need to know how they do it. And how often is it completed? And when is this task completed? So with bathing, if a bathing happens late at night, you need to understand the impact of what the day has on somebody when they're actually going to then do the task. Because if you do the assessment first thing in the morning, it will be very different. So, multiple tasks are often happening in the bath routine. You need to understand what they are. And I'm very keen on bathing as a developmental tool. You can do so much in a bath that you wouldn't necessarily do in other environments. But there's something else about bathing that I think that we often dismiss is, whatever you say, childcare tends to be a female occupation, doesn't it? It's predominantly the, the women who give up work. And I'm looking, going to look at some of the men in here soon. And one of the things that men often get involved in is bathing. Do you agree, Gordon? Yeah? Do you agree? Bathing? Have you got children? That's, no. <laughs> so it, it's one of the things. It's like, dad comes in, mum goes, I'm going for a glass of wine, you're doing bath time. Um, and actually, that relationship is really important. And that relationship of play with dad, we mustn't dismiss the power of that. And we need to think about that. Um, so we need to think about the occupation and the task. So, so what aspects of the model are you going to focus on? What can you change? change uh, changing one aspect will change the relationship with the others and um, with the aim of improving occupational performance. Now that occupational performance might be to enable a child just to be able to wash their face or play with their sibling or actually rest and relax. But we need to know uh, the aim of improving the occupational performance. Uh, so the impact of change is independence, physical well-being, emotional well-being. 
Uh, no, I, I had a conversation with, um, do, does anybody remember John Prescott, Deputy Prime Minister? Um, and I, um, uh, I was going to say, unfortunately, um, I fortunately had a conversation with him about bathing, because we were talking about waiting lists, and I said to him, how would you feel going into the House of Commons if you hadn't bathed or showered for two weeks? And he did the classic politician, well, you know, I'd probably be all right. I said, no, you'd stink. You would stink, because actually, as a gentleman, I don't know whether you know him, he, he, he was a large gentleman, and he was sweating profusely while he was speaking to me. I don't know whether that was because it was me, but he was sweating profusely. And if he had been like that for two weeks and hadn't been able to wash, he wouldn't be going out. Just like some of our clients don't want to go out if they can't wash. So this emotional well-being is really key, really key. And when people say to me, oh, they can strip wash, I, I want them to strip wash for two weeks and see how difficult it is because actually you don't feel clean. But it's also about personal development and uh, physical development. So, getting onto the legislation. How much time have I got? I gave my watch to my mum who was in hospital. 10 minutes, great. Um, mum was in hospital and she didn't have a watch and she said, I'm not orientated in time and space. I thought, yes, that's my mum. Um, so she took my watch. But I want to talk to you about legislation. Legislation should guide and assist your practice. If you work, do people work in social care? Yeah. People work in private practice who try and get DFGs? Yeah. And the relationship between legislation and OC philosophy keeps occupation focused and remain client focused. You can use it really, really well. So this is, is this the one most people know about? Yeah. So the DFG legislation, 1996, it's quite old now, but it's still in place. And the purpose of the grant is making the dwelling houseboat safe for the disabled occupant and others who reside with them. Yeah? That is such a powerful statement, isn't it? And this bit is often left out, because actually, that's not just talking about the client, but it's talking about all the other people who are there and about safety. Now safety could be around manual handling, it could be around the safety of the other person in the property, it could be about um, dad, mum, children, everyone else, keeping everybody safe. And I think we forget about that. But the one I want to talk about is the uh, one that says facilitate access by the disabled occupant to or providing for the disabled occupant a room where there is a bath, or a shower, or both. Who has ever had, or got from a grants officer, the funding for a bath and a shower? Very few. But if we can clinically reason why we're doing it, the legislation says we can get the funding. And it's not up to the grants officer to make that decision. The decision has to be based around clinical reasoning and what's right for that client. Now, I'm not advocating that everybody needs a bath and shower. I'm not advocating that somebody needs definitely a shower. It could be a, a bath, it could be just a shower. But the legislation is there, and if we've assessed our clients' needs and those residing with them, are we making the best recommendation for our client? What we often find is that this or both is often missed out on lots of documents, but don't. I have this as a cut and paste, Gordon and I work together, and I have a cut and paste on this and send it off to uh, grants officers all the time. But there's also the use of that facility, because actually if you're in a, a shower chair and part of your development is around play, it's not usable, is it? So you're not actually meeting the grant requirements. So we need to look at that as well. So if you only do one thing after today, read the grant, the grant section of the Housing Construction Regeneration Grant. It's really small, it's not huge, and it's really worth reading. And know it really well for your grants officers. 
I still wanted to put in the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act, partly because we're still getting lawyers saying to us that it doesn't exist anymore. It does for children. And it's a most fantastic piece of legislation for children. And it says uh, provision of assessing people with a disability falls within the remit of this Act. Uh, includes assessment for adaptations to the home or equipment. Or equipment. Uh, Section 2 lays out a range of services including assistance with home adaptations. So we can use Section uh, Chronically Sick if we need more money over and above the 30,000 to get what we need. Hopefully, the DFG review is not out yet, is it? But I understand that the maximum is going to go up. I keep here 45, 50, who knows? They're taking a long time. But hopefully that will come out before uh, Christmas. But there's also the Children's Act. Schedule 2 of the Act requires local authorities to provide services to minimise the effect of disabled children and their disabilities and give, give such children the opportunity to lead lives which as normal as possible. Is bathing normal? Yes. So by taking it away, are we making them different? Yes. It's about what's right for the child and what's going to work for the child. Um, bathing is regarded as normal activity. Therefore, all children, I believe, should have an opportunity to bathe. If it's right for the child. And you know that if you've done a proper assessment. And then this one I love. Didn't people know this one? Take pictures. The United Nations Convention, uh, 1988, which is on the rights of children. Article 31, play is recognised as a fundamental human right and children have the right to relax and play. Bathing can be about play. And if we take something away, are we meeting it? I don't think we are. And Article 23 says children have any kind of disability, the right of special care and support, as well as the rights to live a full and independent life. That's, that's occupational therapy. And we need to be saying, if you're not meeting the need, because we're not putting in a bath because it's too expensive, uh-uh. No. We put the client at the centre. If it's the right thing for the client, that's what we do. And that's what we advocate for. So to summarise, um, OTEs, our core belief is the importance of occupation. Hopefully you're all on board with that. Respect the value of client-centred practice. Let's put the client back at the centre. Let's not look at policies that restrict. Let's put our client at the centre. And occupation of bathing, we must value this. Don't dismiss it. You might say, no, it's not relevant at this time, but please don't dismiss it. Think about it and look at what other options there are. And I'm being waved at, so I'm just going to go, are there any questions? Any questions? Do you feel that just strip washing could affect somebody's hygiene or not just in smell but also in um, infection control? Oh yes, easily. Um, I don't know, if you've ever been camping and you don't have access to a shower and you do a strip wash, even if you've got full hand function, it's really difficult to wash all those nooks and crannies and you will get infection problems. There's no question about that. You know, you can't get to all those places that you need to get to with a flannel. It's worrying that I stunned you into silence. Yeah, just to back up what you were saying, we had a lady who kept on getting UTIs because she was strip washing. Though I think the carers weren't able to meet her needs. Yeah, she kept on getting UTIs from her. Yeah, and I think it's one of those things we never talk about intimate care, do we? And, and sometimes I have the most bizarre conversations in bathrooms around how do you wash your groin? And, and actually, it's an important question to ask because it is an area where you get infections and yeast build up and all that lovely stuff. And we need to know, are we going to be able to meet the needs of our clients? So it's a question we need to ask. Yeah, Gordon's just raised, you know, if you're strip washing as well, there's always an issue around falls. 
because actually if you're trying to get into nooks and crannies in difficult positions, you're not always stable. And I don't know how you could stand and strip wash and wash your feet unless you're really flexible. I mean, if I got you all to stand up and touch your feet, there'd be a few who couldn't do it. I'm not going to try. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you so much for coming. If you want, thank you. Oh, if you want to come and see the bath, we've just produced, um, or oh, Abacus, we, that sounds very grand. Abacus have just produced a longer bath, uh, a, a Gemini bath, which is amazing, absolutely amazing. So it enables us to go into adults who are slightly taller and longer. And they're on J, J40. Come and see us. Okay, thank you so much.